Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I guess everybody here knows I play bridge. <laughs> and I play on the internet. And I play on what they call bridge based online. And I was playing with this girl for about six months. And all I knew about her was her name was Lucky Lou. She was born in Kenya. Her mother was born in Kenya. And she was a chef. And then one day we were playing online and someone said, has your book been published yet? And she says, yes, you can buy it on Amazon.com. And I said, oh, you wrote a book? And she said, yes. So she sent me a copy. And when I got it, <laughs> I almost died when I looked at the cover. I thought I had been playing with a big black woman from Kenya for six months. And I wasn't. I was playing with this woman. <laughs> And this is the third person that I've met. My husband and my family think I'm crazy. They said, you try and keep your children from going out and meeting people online. This is the third person <laughs> I've met online. And they've all turned out to be nice. <laughs> I have to say that. And uh, I, that's all I knew about her. And then when I read her book and everything, I thought, gee, she'd be a wonderful speaker for our lecture series. And her book is going to be made into a movie, right? Yeah, I think so. And she's writing a second book now. So I, th I think she's a very interesting person. She's lived on three continents, Africa, Europe, and the United States. She's lived in, what, five different countries. And she speaks four languages, which is three more than I do. <laughs> So she's doing very well. So I'd like to introduce you to Anne Jane Murray. Anna. I'm sorry, Anna Jane Murray, better known as Lucky Lou. Uh -huh. Oh, by the way, Lucky Lou is the name of her boyfriend's cat who was killed in an accident, and his family asked if she'd like to have the cat. She still has it, don't you? Yeah. And the funny thing is, she met him online, too. Playing <laughs> great. So I introduced Lucky Lou. Hello, welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk to you this afternoon. Um, first, of, well, first of all, the um, internet has a lot to do with what's happened to me, how, why I'm in, in the United States first, and the reason that I'm here is meeting Maureen online. And um, I played bridge with Paul online from she France. Do you want to put the microphone up a little bit? I don't know if they can hear Oh, me. sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 And um, I came over here to, to meet him and these other the rest of the people that we played with, which was in Canada. He met me in um, Dallas, and we drove to Canada, and we all had a wonderful time, and then we both fell in love. <laughs> and I decided to move over here. But unfortunately, he was killed in a car accident, and his family asked me to have his cat, which is why I am Lucky Lou. So that's how we get to there. For, um, I... I have my book there. My, my great-grandparents went out to Kenya in the early 1900s. My grandfather went out to see what was happening in Kenya. He left his family in England, his wife and three children, four children, and, um, and then his wife died. So he sent out for his two older children, two older sons. They came out, and a few years later, when his two younger ones were a bit old, they were staying with relations, they came out to Kenya, and it was his younger son and daughter, and his daughter died in Aden, with a 14-year-old brother accompanying her. He had to bury her. He couldn't tell anybody that his sister had died because the mayor went on the same boat that he was on going to Kenya. So he arrived in Mombasa, and then had to tell his family that his sister had died in Aden. <clears throat> in the meantime, my grandmother had gone, this was all about 1900, 1910, 
Um, can you hear me? Sorry, I keep moving away from this mic. Um, okay, sorry. Perhaps if I get a bit closer. Um, it, uh, my grandmother in 1910 went out to Kenya as Beryl Markham's governess. I don't know if any of you have heard of Beryl Markham. She, yes, she, she flew, she was the first woman to fly from west to east, a, a solo as a woman. Um, in, it was just, bef it might have been before the First World War or during the First World War, but anyway, she ended up flying in the First World War with Amelia Earhart. And they became great buddies. And, um, and then, uh, but my grandmother, as I said, oh, now I can hear it. <laughs> ah, we weren't switched on, sorry. <laughs> um, my grandmother um, went out as her governess when she was a little, little thing, and she, she was absolutely horrific, um, putting toads in her governess's bed and snakes under the pillow and um, anything to get rid of the governess. Well, um, um, my grandmother stuck it out, and we found, we, I heard much later on that she actually had a little fling with Beryl's father. And um, my uncle was born. <laughs> but before that event, my grandfather, who was this youngest son who'd had to bury his sister in Aden, married her. He was there, by then about 18, 19. He married her, because they're all young, to give the child a name. So <clears throat> um, they then go ahead and have my aunt and my, my, my mother. Who, so they're born in Kenya. Now, during the First World War, my father was in Scotland, and he was sent out to Kenya to protect it against Tanzania, which was uh, German. And, um, and just let me tell you about Kenya and Kenya. Up until 1922, this country was called British East Africa but it, it included Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. There were the three countries, and they were called British East Africa as one. In 1922, they became Kenya, Uganda, and Tanganyika. And um, in 1962, 63, it was sort of over the um, new year, um, Kenya got its independence, and it became Kenya which was named after Jomo Kenyatta, who was the first president of Kenya, which I s struggle to say, <laughs> because I left on that day. I never lived in Kenya, I lived in Kenya. So, but it, you know, there were these time spans where the names changed. Anyway, um, my, my father liked it so much when he was in Kenya, looking at, you know, protecting it against Tanzania, that, that when he went back to Scotland, they offered him a, a patch of land and said, go and pace out your land. Here's 10 pounds, start a new life. He jumped at it. It was um, in 1924. Uh, and um, he, uh, they were all trying to find out what they could grow, coffee, they were trying sisal, they were um, pyrethrum. Um, the, there were so, uh, the, the, temp the difference in the climate was enormous because I, when, when I was about 10, we actually lived at 10,000 feet. And there were, there were certain things that you could grow, like wheat and um, pyrethrum. Um, and then there, you had to go a bit lower for tea and coffee, you know, sort of seven to 8,000 feet for tea and coffee. And um, even lower to 5,000 feet as well but um, we were right up in the highlands. So there was a lot of, the country was sort of like this, so you didn't really know what was gonna grow where. And they tried it out, they tried out all sorts of things. My father eventually, my mother was his third wife, my father eventually married my, wife, my, my mother in um, 1950, and, and I came along. So that's really where the story starts. So. Um, the first bit, I just needed to let you know my background and how we got to Kenya, Kenya as it is now. And um, 
we actually, we had a, um, my father had a duka, which is um, a, a shop in Malindi um, on the coast. I was born on the coast. But he wasn't very well. He was actually a lot older than my mother. And we moved up country to um, um, Tanzania. It was just on the, on the um, slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro. It was also during the Mau Mau. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Mau Mau, but it's, um, some, some have, but it's, um, I had to, I, when I first wrote the book, I was thinking, I wrote the Mau Mau, thinking everybody knew about it. And um, the manager at work said, you know, a lot of Americans aren't going to know what the Mau Mau is. You're going to have to explain it. Well, in the, um, it was about 1952, and the, um, the Kikuyu tribe, who were really um, rather, uh, they were warriors, and they were bored. They were bored with having the, the whites running their country. They, they wanted something to happen. So they started um, trying to run the whites out of the country. They, they did really ghastly, ghastly things. They um, fa managed to find um, arms, they then um, attacked families. We all had um, shutters on all the windows to protect us at night. It was called the emergency. And, but they did the most ghastly things. They, they'd go into people's houses, tie them up with barbed wire, shoot them, or leave them to die. They would also um, hamstring the cattle and leave them with their legs up in the air, bellowing in terrible pain, uh, you know, having broken their legs while they did it. And uh, the owners would come find them the next morning, you know, and have to shoot them. But they'd ha suffered all night. And it was, it was really pretty ghastly. And you didn't know who was going to be next. And it was really quite a frightening time. And I remember, I was only this size. And I remember being told that there was this ogre that they were trying to hunt. They were trying to find this ogre. And all I could think about ogre was Jack and the Beanstalk. So to me, this ogre was a great big man, probably green as far as I know, but you know, he was something that was in my storybooks. I didn't really realize that he was a real person. <laughs> anyway, um, because I was so young, they actually caught him in 1954 and he was jailed for 10 years, nine, 10 years. <clears throat> and, um, and, that, and that was Joma Kenyatta. When Joma Kenyatta was let out of prison in 1962, 63, he became the first president of Kenya. And it, he changed the name to Kenya. Well, <clears throat> Having moved up to Tanzania, and we've got this terrible uh, Mau Mau going on, we, it sort of calmed down. They caught him, and we felt a bit safer. So we went back into Kenya, and, but my father wasn't very well. We moved up to Nakuru, and he, he, was <clears throat> he died in Nakuru. And I, I blame myself because... Every day, well, I, I was six, and I used to walk with him to go and meet my mother, who was working in the accountants, not very far away. And every afternoon, he and I would walk along to greet her in the afternoon, and then we'd walk back together to, the, to our house. And um, this day, he said, you'll have to go and meet Mum on your own, because I'm not feeling well. Tell Mum I'm not feeling well. Well, I was, very, I was a six-year-old little brat or something, <laughs> and I um, thought, I was cross with him. I was angry that he wasn't coming with me. You know, what, how did he dare not come with me? And so I went skiffing off, met my mother, and we were just about to get home, <clears throat> and I said, um, oh, a dad's ill, by the way. She flew into the house, and she called the ambulance, she called the doctor, he was rushed into hospital. He died three weeks later. But to me, I had killed him because I had not told her. When I had been told to tell my mother that he, had, um, he was ill, I, 
I didn't tell my mother. And I, I lived with that guilt till I was about 14. And I really thought that it was my fault that he died. And it was only much later on when we were in South Africa that I said to my mother, you know, I've never ever got over the fact that if I had told you earlier, perhaps dad could have been saved. And she said, no. Nothing, you know, two or three minutes is not going to, have, would not have saved him. And I said, oh, really? And she said, yes. I said, oh, and all these years I thought that because I didn't own up to it and that I, it, that I hadn't told you that it was my fault that he died. And um, she said, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, so I was sort of, I had that lifted off me. But I mean, I did go for a lot of years as a little child thinking that it was my fault that he died. Anyway, we then had to, my mother then had to pick up everything and start again, you know, with two young children, there was my brother and I, and we moved, she took over a hotel in the Highlands in Kenya, which was 9,000 9, feet, and my best friends had a place at 10,000 feet. We were really high up. It was very warm during the day, it was very cool at night, and everybody had log fires, we didn't have heating, we didn't have air conditioning, but we had every, every room had a log fire every night. And, um, and we were there until independence, when um, my, um, everybody was told they had to either uh, become Kenya citizens or lose, uh, and lose their British passports or keep their British passports and get out. Well, some decided to become Kenya citizens and others chose to um, um, keep their British passports and get out. Well, my mother was one of them. She, she didn't know what was going to happen to the country. She, she had two young children. We were um, uh, 11 and 12, and she didn't know what the future was going to do. So she, and she said, decided that she was not going to lose the British passport. So... <coughs> I had just finished primary school and I was having to move on and I was going to change schools. Well, she didn't want me to start changing to a school in, in, in Kenya and then move me to South Africa, which is where we were going. So she, put, she took me down to Mombasa where I, we met a family who she'd obviously been liaising with by telephone perhaps and letter, I don't know. And we met them there. They had four boys and we, this was the first time any of us had met them, and then I went to South Africa with them. I left my mother, who I had never left before, you know, and it was all very sad. <laughs> and I said goodbye to my brother, you know. He was at boarding school, so he was away most of the time anyway, but I was, it was a little bit, I was excited and I was sad, you know, because I had never been away from home. And, and I was only 12. Anyway, off I go. And my mother eventually sold up everything at the, uh, in Kenya and came out, um, to, came down to South Africa. And she actually died in South Africa when I was 15, cancer. And I finished school and then I, I um, wanted to go in her footsteps, which she was uh, um, very well known in, in our hotel, the Highlands Hotel, for her catering. People used to come from Nairobi to eat at our hotel. They just loved her food. And I decided that's what I wanted to do. It was difficult to get that sort of training in South Africa at that time. It was when there was apartheid. Now, this is another thing. I haven't actually gone into this very much in the book, but I was brought up with apartheid. I then lived with apartheid until I was 16. It didn't mean anything to me. I was a kid. I didn't know what all this was. It was just something I just knew existed until I went to England. And I am, I'm too young to do my catering tra um, uh, training that I wanted to do. So my aunt, who I went to live with, sent me to a private secretarial college. There were five white people in the class and 15 yellow, brown, black, and they were wonderful people. I was never allowed to sit in a room with a black person before. And I'm sitting next to one. And they're human. <laughs> you know, 
and they're wonderful people. And I had the Chinese and we had Indians and they were wonderful people. And I thought, my goodness, you know, what have I been brought up with? All this segregation. I haven't gone into this because this is not really um, part of the book, but it, it sort of grabs me sometimes, you know, and I think, that's another book, <laughs> perhaps, you know, um, because it, when I got to England, there was um, all this integration. You know, we were all, I was in the class with only five white people, you know, and I'd never had anything like that before. And anyway, to cut a long story short, I then um, start my training, and eventually I meet, I, you know, I have lost both my parents. I am trying to... I, I think that I know it all. I am very young. I don't know it all, but I think I do. And um, I fall in love with the first boy that comes along. I get pregnant by him. Um, and, and I run away with him. Now, you know, some of the things that are written in the book, I, I can't believe I actually did. You know, they're just... <laughs> So awful. I think, mean, you know, who on earth would do things like that? <laughs> and, um, and I did all the things that all teenagers do. You know, I didn't take drugs and I didn't drink. But I did all the other things. That <laughs> I had a, a baby out of wedlock, you know, and that was, in those days, was absolutely dramatic. You know, and, and, and I didn't feel anything, and everybody was frowning down on me, and I didn't feel anything. I, you know, this is my son, and I'm very happy. Anyway, I did eventually marry the father, who I didn't marry to start with, and, um, and then, but for 10 months, and then we got rid of him. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he was no good. My aunt told me he was no good, and I wouldn't believe her. And he was no good. <laughs> You know, I wouldn't be told. Anyway, we got rid of him. And Anthony and I struggled to make a living. I made a living to support him. And uh, um, the, 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 there's a lot that goes on but, um, in that short life. Um, but um, uh, eventually, he was, a, he was about... Um, well, when he was seven, I got him into a private school. I paid for it. I got no support from his father. I worked. I didn't have holidays. I didn't have clothes. I did nothing but pay for his education. And that was just fine, as far as I was concerned. He had had quite a rough beginning, if, which you will see in the book. If you buy the book and read it, you'll see that he had quite a rough beginning. And, um, and things got better and better and better. And by the time he was 14, he was at a public school, <coughs> which is um, a senior private school. He got a scholarship to go there, and, um, and we felt very fortunate. I had a really fabulous job. He was in a very, very good school, and, and I was, I, 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 I thought, whew! You know, after all the things that have happened to me, I got to write about this, and I started writing a book. But I didn't want him to read all the nasty things that I'd been up to. <laughs> so I put in other names, and I didn't call him, he, he was called Anthony. I didn't put Anthony, I called him Jimmy or whatever, I can't remember. But I put all different names, and I was telling the story without mentioning any real names. So he, if, if he happened to snoop, as all teenagers do, I did, <laughs> he, you know, and pick it up and say, Mum, what is this? You know, I'd say, well, I'm writing a story. Um, and, um, but he never did that. He didn't have the time. Um, because that year that I started writing that, when everything was going well, he wanted to go skiing with his friends from school. And I said, Anthony, you know, if you want to go skiing, then I, I can't pay for your school fees and your uniform. You know, in England, you have uniforms. And, um, but if you want to go to the state school, we can go skiing. No, it's okay, Mum, don't worry. And then he came back to me and he said, what if I worked 
and paid for the skiing and you paid for the pocket money because they need just as much money to spend on eating and doing the things with his buddies as he does for skiing. It would come to about double the price of the ski trip. So I said, okay, there's a deal. So he worked on the farm where I was working and I was the, um, the, the cook there and the chef. And but they had young, uh, their own sons working on the farm. They had 3,000 acres, which they combined. And, you know, there was a lot of work there so that he could earn money. And he, he was doing this. And there was just the most frightful accident. He, he was um, weighing in the grain. The tractors would come, and he would weigh them. They would go off, unload it, and then come back, and he'd weigh it again. So then he would just take the difference, and that was the weight of the grain. And then he, um, he heard a blockage up there, so he called the manager. And the manager came, and um, he said, I've got to get up there. There's something blocking it. And Anthony went with him. Now, Anthony was 15. He was six foot. And... John, the farm manager, says, I'm going to have to get in there and unblock it, like he would a drain, you know. Anthony said, oh, I'll do it. John said, fine. And he let him go down the, this ladder in this huge big silo and walk along poles and lean against higher poles and then rod it, as they called, just like you do a drain in your sink, you know, which is blocked. <clears throat> and John went up out of the ladder he went downstairs to watch to see if it was coming through, and then he heard a scream. He came running back up, and he looked down, and he saw Anthony in the grain. He flew down the ladder, and he grabbed his hands, and he couldn't pull him out. It was sucking him under. And he had to let go and go back up, out, switch it off, come back, down again, and Anthony had gone. And... I arrived every evening at 6 o'clock with a thermos of tea and a bun because he'd been working since 7 o'clock in the morning. And I'd come, he'd have, uh, we'd have brought lunch to all the boys, but at 7 o'clock before I went to work, I would bring him a thermos of tea. And I had just arrived with the thermos of tea and the bun. And uh, the, the farm manager's boy said to me, oh, can you go and park up at the back there? The services are coming. Well, the, day, the year before, when Anthony was doing the same job, I saw the grain being siphoned out of the silo, and um, when I asked, they said, oh, there's been a fire in the silo. They're trying to save the grain. And it was the same thing when I came this time. The si they were siphoning the, si uh, the grain out, but only to try and find Anthony. I didn't know that. And they said, um, park at the back, so I did. And when I came back to the front, um, I said, what's happened? And they said, they can't find him. I said, find who? They said, Anthony. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, he's fallen in the silo. Oh, that was just the worst time in my whole life. I flew up there. I was looking over, and there were, the, there were 10 people in the, in the silo trying to feel for him. You can't um, actually, it's not like water that you can swim under to find anybody. You, just, you can only go as deep as your arm. And they, so they were trying to suck the grain out to try and find I said, he's dead. And they said, don't. And they took me back to the house. Uh, anyway, I, an, an hour later, they found him. And of course he was. So that was the biggest tragedy of my life. This boy that I had fought for. And I mean, I had fought for him. Which, you, if you buy the book, you'll see. I had fought for him so hard to keep him. I was born on Friday the 13th. He was born on Friday the 13th. He died on the 13th. And you know, I was so sick. I was so sick because when he was born on Friday the 13th, my aunt, because I, I wasn't married, you are not bringing that baby home. It's very bad luck. He's born on Friday the 13th. There no good will come of him. And I just thought, oh, when he died on the 13th, I said to people, I said to my brother, I said, don't let my aunt come near me because I will blame her for his death. She's 350 miles away. 
but she killed him. As far as I'm concerned, she killed him. She said this when he was born. And um, anyway, it was about six months later that I, she came to the funeral and everything, but um, I just, there were lots of people there, so I didn't have to, I had her diluted. Anyway, um, I tried to make peace with her about six months later. Um, she didn't know that I was trying to make peace with her. She didn't know that she, uh, how I felt. I didn't tell her because I feel that if you say something, you can never take it back. I didn't want to say something that I was going to regret because she was my only relation. And although at that precise moment, I hated her, I didn't want, uh, you know, she had killed my son. And, but of course, you know, when I um, realized that, in fact, she had nothing to do with it. You know, it's a, it, it's, it's, it's a, um, a story, you know, this 13th is a story. It just happened that it was an extraordinary coincidence that it was, that I was born on that day, he was, and he died on the 13th, not on a Friday, it was a Tuesday. And, um, you know, we were fine. I was fine, but I needed that six months to be able to just calm myself down so that I wouldn't say anything that I would regret. Because, you know, there's no point in ruining something that, um, you know, she was my only relation, other than my brother, you know. And um, it, it, it was very, very difficult getting over all this. And I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever been suicidal, but my goodness, I got very close, very, very close. And um, the, 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 the manager of the, the farm who couldn't pull him out, he actually threw himself over the combine. He was so distraught about what happened. He, didn't, he wasn't killed. He, 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 you know, he recovered, he was okay. But he, it was, he and I were both very affected by that. Um, you know, he felt guilty because he hadn't, couldn't save him. Uh, and I, I mean, I didn't feel anything for him. I just, it was, you know, the loss I had. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I couldn't, I, I had to leave the farm eventually. When the next summer came, I said, I'm not going to be able to manage the, um, um, the harvest again, you know, that would just be too, too close to home. So I got other, another job. It didn't work out. I hated it. I got another job. I hated it. Got another job. I hated it. <laughs> and I thought, and I said, you know, I'm unemployable. I can't work. I just can't get on with anybody. I hate everybody. I don't want to work for them. I don't, I don't want to work. I don't want to get out of bed. <laughs> and, um, and I was really getting worried that I was not going to um, be able to go on, you know, because I couldn't work. Anyway, I went to my, I had an agent um, where I got really good jobs. And I said, look, I need another job. I need something, you know, really good. She sent me for three interviews. One was to um, an earl in Colm, and he was a friend of Prince Charles's. The other was to Anthony Andrews, who's a film star who was in... Um, Hmm. That's it, thank you. Right, Ed Rivestone. And then, and then there was um, Freddie Head, who was a top jockey in France. So, but the people I was working for, I, I was supposed to be there as a chef, and I ended up doing the laundry, hoovering, doing the ironing, you know, and I said, you know, I'm, I, I'm not a housekeeper. I'm allergic to cleaning. <laughs> I cook. <laughs> and they said, oh, no, we, do, we don't want to lose you. We don't want to lose you. We'll, we'll, we'll get a cleaner. I said, OK, but I'm not here to make your bed, change your sheets, do your ironing, or anything, or sweep the floor. You, you know, I don't mind sweeping the floor in the kitchen, but not in the rest of the house. I'm not doing the housework. Oh, no, 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 we don't want to lose you. I said, okay, fine. So I told the agents, I, I didn't, I said, I'll go for these interviews. Because 
I couldn't go out of the door. I actually struggled to walk out of the door. I didn't do anything. I had no life. I didn't go meet my friends. I, I did nothing. And I thought, you know, it would probably do me good. I'm going to go for these interviews for fun. I don't want the jobs. I'm going to go for fun. If you get me out, I'm going to meet total strangers that don't know me, don't know my background, and just just have a bit of fun. This is going to be an outing for me. So I did these. Well, the first two were to Kong to see the Earl. Huh, I wouldn't have had that job if you paid me. Um, then I went to meet Anthony Andrews and his wife, who was um, uh, what, a Simpson of Simpsons in Piccadilly. And um, uh, uh, very nice, yeah. But yeah, I wasn't looking for a job, so that I wasn't terribly interested. And then I was flown to Paris to meet Freddie Head and his family. Well, I'm still not looking for a job, but I'm going for this interview just to see. And I get there, and I'm offered the job. And I get this beautiful cottage with a car, a fabulous salary, um, and I just have to cook for these people. No, they have a cleaner, they have somebody who does laundry, they have a gardener, they have two nannies. So I'm not gonna get any of those. <laughs> those have been allocated to other people. I'm just going to cook, yay. And they offered me an enormous amount of money for this. And they're away for the whole of August and for two months in the winter. They go to the Bahamas. They're jockeys. They don't race in the, in the winter. I thought, wow. And I went back to England and, and I spoke to my brother and I said, you know, I've just been offered a job I can't turn down. And my brother said, you take it. Because I would have told you this three years ago but I knew you couldn't leave here. That was too soon. He said, go, just get out of England, start again. And I'm, I, that was the best thing anybody could ever say to me. I packed up my bags, I went to France. I couldn't speak a word of French. <laughs> but you know what, when you've had a child or children, it's a challenge. Every day is a challenge. Just take it away, take the challenge away, and you just, you, you don't know why you got up in the morning. You know, and, and that's where the stage I was at. I needed something to make me get up in the morning. I hadn't got anything. I didn't really care whether I lived or died. I didn't care. But suddenly I get this job, and I have to learn French, otherwise I'm gonna go. <laughs> and, and I lived there for 13 years. I worked for Freddie Head for 18 months, and then I got bored of cooking, cooking, I wasn't cooking, salad and black coffee, because he's a jockey and he can't eat. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so actually my cooking skills were just um, cooking the dog food in the microwave. I mean, you know, that, and I thought, this is no fun. Anyway, I, I suck it for 18 months because here I am in France, they paid for my um, uh, uh, French lessons and, um, and I've got a very nice place I'm living in and you know, it's such an easy job. I can, I, and I go, go and play bridge and all the rest of it. Anyway, but then I, um, I, uh, the neighbors asked me to do a dinner party once when they were away. I said, you ask my boss whether they mind if I come and do a dinner party for you while they're away. So they did, and they said, no, sure, go ahead. So I went and did this dinner party, and they had people from the embassy, from the British embassy in Paris. And they said, you know, we need somebody just like you to, to, to do our dinner parties. I said, well, for goodness sake, I'll give you all my details. <laughs> and you know, it, that started my new business, which was called Anna's Kitchen in Paris. And um, I then left them, and rented a cottage from the people that I was actually doing the dinner. They had a cottage down sort of at the end of their farm. And, and I built a, a prep kitchen down there and I um, did all these um, receptions, dinners, lunches in Paris. And then they got to hear about me in Shanti where I lived. The racing people it was very big in racing Shanti. And um, the jockeys, they already knew, quite a lot of them knew me because I was working for a jockey and the trainers, and, and then the hunting people, and I got involved with the hunt, and, and suddenly all these people 
needed me. And I'm here, I'm an English person in France cooking for the French. And that was really quite something. <laughs> anyway, that's when uh, I was there for 13 years. And I suppose that <clears throat> the fact that I had to, I'm not even looking at the clock. Um, I was wondering whether I was rambling on too much. Um, I, I, um, I didn't know whether um, um, it, it was, um, oh gosh, now, that, that took me off my train of thought, I beg your pardon. <laughs> um, yes, I was there for 13 years and I built this business up, but then I, met, I started on the internet. And this is where we all come in with Maureen and I. <laughs> and I played bridge. I found the bridge room. That was the first place I found on the internet. Somebody said to me, you need to get the internet. I said, what do I need the internet for? Oh, for your business. I said, well, I need the computer for my business to write invoices and things. OK, I'll get the internet. So I get the internet, and I don't know what on earth I'm going to do with this. And I'm playing around with it, and I suddenly see bridge. I go in there. And I start playing bridge. I, you know, I find the bridge room and I play bridge. And then I get to know these people. And in fact, I met masses in Paris, just like Maureen, meeting all these people <laughs> off the internet. You know? And <clears throat> and then um, I um, decided I went to Norway. Uh, oh no, first of all, um, I had a very good Norwegian partner who came to Paris, and I met him and his family, and they was so kind, they invited me back to Norway. So I went to visit them in Norway, up in their cottage right up in the mountains, had a wonderful time, and then I decided that I was going to visit my American and Canadian friends that I played bridge with. So I've met at Dallas. We drove to Canada to meet the other people that played on our foursome. And he and I, Paul, who met me at the airport, and I fell in love. <laughs> and he asked me to move over here. You know, I went actually backwards and forwards a few times first. And then he said, come on, I think you need to move over here. So I did, eventually. And I came over. I actually moved lock, stock, and barrel on the 9th of, no, the 11th of September, 2001. And I left Paris. I had breakfast in London with my brother, because I had three hours in London. <coughs> I had sent my cat and dog the day before, because I had to send them by Air France. Now, um, I was going cheapo, cheapo virgin. So and my flight left at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I wanted to put my animals on the plane. I didn't want somebody else putting them on the plane. So I sent them the day before. Paul was going to meet them that afternoon, and I was going to arrive the next day. Well, I left the next day, left my brother, just going over Ganda, and we are told, we've got a technical hitch, we have to come down in Ganda, Newfoundland. I, I didn't know where Ganda was. As well. I thought they said Uganda, and I said, what are we doing flying over Africa? I thought I was going to Dallas. <laughs> And then they said, no, it's Gander in Newfoundland. I said, oh, OK. So we go down, and we're going like this, parking, and there's planes everywhere. And the pilot says, if you're looking out the window and you think everybody is, every, all these other planes have got technical hitches, I have to tell you that um, the twin t one of the twin towers has gone down, has been bombed by an aeroplane. And about almost as he said that, he said, and I've just been told the second one has gone. So you can imagine how close we were. You know, we were, we were actually right over Gander when it all happened. And we came straight down. And then the next plane was so quick after that. And then he, we, we were on the plane for 19 hours. They couldn't get us off because there were 10,000 of us. And um, But they kept us up to date on what was... Um, what was happening when we got when we um, eventually got off? We were taken to this low building where they gave us a paper bag with sandwiches and drinks, 
we got up at four o'clock in the morning. We'd been on since six o'clock in the morning before, <laughs> our, our European time. And, um, and then um, we were bused to a school. We ha were told to take the blanket and the pillow from the plane. We had nothing else except the hand luggage that was above us. And that's what we slept with, the little rug and the pillow. And, and there were telephones in the street for people to use to phone in to say they were OK. They were absolutely fantastic, the Canadians. They were absolutely wonderful. They provided, when we got there, there was food, hot food in there. You could help to have food 24 hours a day. There were drinks, there was everything. Um, they'd got big televisions up so everybody could watch what had happened, what was going on all the time. Um, we didn't have very comfortable accommodation to sleep on, but, you know, we were alive. And um, we were there for five days, and we were on the, uh, my plane was the first flight into Dallas. And um, they warned us that the press would be there, and we would be um, um, probably questioned, and, um, about it, you know, and be ready for it. And I just stuck my head down and I saw Paul and I ran. I said, I'm out of here. <laughs> and, um, and, and I get back to Paul's house and there is my dog and cat who say, oh, hi, Mum. Where have you been all this time? <laughs> I don't think they'd miss me. <laughs> but they'd settled in. And, um, and then um, when I got here, I thought I was going to retire. I was 50 and I was going to retire. And, Take it easy. But it doesn't happen like that, does it? You get bored <laughs> when you've been working all your life. I then got a job um, where I am still at, at this um, um, restaurant. It's an English restaurant. And um, it was actually, he and I actually split up after that. We decided that it wasn't going to work. Um, but that was OK. Um, I was going to stay because my animals, everybody was here. Everything I've owned was here, so I was going to stay. And, um, and it was while I was working there that I got a phone call to say that he had been killed in a car accident. And um, he was only 53. It was very sad. He had a stroke at the wheel. Um, and then his, his family asked me if I'd have his cat, who was Lucky Lou. So, hence, my name online is Lucky Lou. And, um, and I, I love my job. I have a very, my boss, I get on very well with. Um, she has been very good to me. And um, a lot of things have happened since I've been in the States. A lot of <laughs> things that could have happened on Friday the 13th, probably. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just love my job. I, I and uh, I'm a hostess now. I used to be the chef there. I am the hostess in the restaurant, and people kept saying, "Oh my goodness, you need to write about this. It's so interesting," and um, so I did. And I have commended my customers in the pub. You know, in in the front of the book, it's you that drove me to finish this book now, <laughs> because. After Anthony died, I changed the book. I put the names in, the real names in, and, um, and then carried on like that. But it's taken me 23 years to write it. And, um, and I, I, I think, you know, the whole thing has been a learning curve. It's been a, uh, France was a, um, um, it was, it, it was, bringing me back to life, I think. You know, I, I needed the challenge, which I got in France, and having lost it with Anthony going, you know. So I think that was probably the best thing I ever did, was to take on something that I <laughs> was <laughs> way above me, you know, and, um, and managed to get through it. And, um, and that's what my story is. So if anybody's got any questions, you know, I'd be glad to answer any. Thank you. Where is the restaurant you work in? It's, it's in um, um, Upperville in Virginia. 
and um, it's called the Hunter's Head Tavern. It's organic. It's organic and it, um, humanely raised. Um, my um, boss has a farm, 800 acres just behind the restaurant where she raises um, English rare breeds and they're all organic and humanely raised and we um, sell, we, we sell it in the restaurant and she has a shop in Middleburg which is seven miles away where she sells all the organic stuff and we ship, we ship wherever, New York wherever. <laughs> Yes, it's it's because uh, I work in both now. I work in the in the restaurant um, on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Today, I'm in the store selling beef, and well, I actually don't sell the uh, the butcher side. I do the deli side. So um, you know, uh, um, it's 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 fascinating. I I really enjoy it, and I think I found my niche. <laughs> There's a lot of Welsh in the club. Tell them about catering. You said that was one of the nicest parties you ever did was for the Welsh Embassy. Uh, yes. Well, it was actually, no, it was, it was the, um, it was at the British Embassy, but it was for the Welsh, um, the, the Welsh, it was, it was like a, an authority from Wales, you know, they were, they had, uh, like a Welsh board, you know, people, they were, um, and I had to find Welsh recipes to produce for this this evening as a cocktail party. And, um, you know, there were, uh, it, it took a lot of <laughs> research to find all, because I'm not, I'm not Welsh, um, but you have to look, look around to find what, you know, you've got to have lamb, because you know, there's nothing but lamb in Wales. And there was all sorts of other, um, I think it was Cumberland sausages, which are Cumberland sausages are actually um, like potato and cabbage, but shaped in a sausage. And they're, um, but they're, they're from Wales, you know, that's what, one of their traditional things. And um, I can't think of all the other things, but we did, hmm? Faggots, yes, yes, yes. Actually, you know, there's an awful lot of um, vegetarian stuff in Wales. Um, well, they're, um, they're, it's like ground meat, and it's been covered in, it's probably got onions and um, spices in it, and it's got, <coughs> it's covered with a, a lining of a stomach, and it looks like a, 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 um, a spider's web over it, and then you just fry it, or you um, saute it in a pan, or put it in the oven. Yes. And then you can sort of break it up, and yes, make it into a sausage gravy, like a sausage gravy. Yes. Yes, he was the leader. He was the leader. Yeah. That's why I choke to I'm say Kenya. Uh -huh. I choke. Yeah. No, this was totally different. Yeah, okay. Nelson Mandela was. was what, Nelson Mandela was a good man. Yeah. Um, Jomo Kenyatta was not. Jomo Kenyatta was the leader of the terrorists, and he became the first president, and that's why I choke when I, I cannot say Kenya very often. <laughs> yes. Yes, Uhuru. What? Uhuru. Yes. Yes. I read that about Kenyan flesh and yes. Yeah. And it was very interesting. Yes. Oh, no, that, 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 that has the whole, that's why you know all about the Mama. That is the story. Yeah, well, that, that really is a very descriptive book to read. And um, you see, I left on January the 1st, 1963. 
So, and, and that Uhuru came out, and you know, it was banned in Kenya. And then it got banned in South Africa, and I had a copy. I have a copy now at home, um, which was banned wherever I went. But I had it, you know. Oh, well, uh, Joma Kenyatta. Yeah. Yeah, oh, well, he I'm, was... I mean, Robert Roark. Robert Roark, yes. Yes. Uh, yes, he was. Um, but there's... Um, you know, there's a lot of um, feelings of um, people because... You know, a lot of people said, oh, come on, the whites came in and they took over their country and, and uh, you know, uh, this is the African country. But they've now got it back and I've been back and it's awful. They don't know how to run the country. Well, that's the story of that. And, and, and the thing is that if they had only taken what they were... T well, you see, the problem was that we were only just beginning education. Let... Um, give them a hundred years, and they would be able to um, go back. And, I mean, we want people like Obama to go back there. <laughs> you, you know, um, educated people. Now, the problem is that some there are a lot of educated Africans now in Kenya. I left in 1963, January 1963. We only spoke Swahili to the... Ooh, sorry, to the Africans, they didn't speak English. I went back in 1989, they all spoke English. And I was trying to buy a hippo, and they were going, blah, 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 and, I, we were saying, and then he'd come back with a price. I said, no. I said, I know what you're saying. And they said, <laughs> I said, yes, I was born here, and I speak Swahili. <laughs> and I said, just don't wring our necks. You know, we'll pay for it, but just don't think you're going to get away with a huge price. And um, so they laughed and, you know, came down in price. But um, <clears throat> there, there, there's an awful lot of people that really feel sorry for them and for the Africans who, who were taken over by the Europeans. And British, sorry, you know that's me. Um, but um, but in fact, they were actually taught how to. I mean, the British actually produced a good economy with big farms, and they produced wheat, and they produced coffee, and they produced tea. But I went back to where we used to live, and I mean, these huge big farms were t tiny little shambas, which are like. Um, your back yard. You know, each person was given a patch to grow something in. I mean, that's not any good for the economy. And they all had jobs and they all got paid. Now they have nothing. And, and the saddest thing that I saw the other day was on the news. I have never, ever heard of my village, the village I lived in, ever mentioned by anybody. It is a dot on the landscape. Nobody's ever heard of it. And it's called Molo, M-O-L-O. -O. <clears throat> there was a thing in the, um, I think it was online I saw it, about this um, tanker that w tipped over. And all these Africans went with their jerry cans to get free gas because they are so poor, they can't afford to pay for gas for their vehicles. A hundred of them perished because it blew up. I mean, that is horrific. They are so poor, they can't buy gas. And, you know, they're so poor because they're trying to run a country that they don't know how to run. And, uh, I mean, you know, um, those poor Africans. I mean, I, that's how I feel because I'm, I, I, I feel terrible that they are—they don't have enough money for gas, 
and they have to go and take it off a tanker that is about to explode and take that risk, you know. <clears throat> and it happened in Molo, this little village that I came from. I couldn't believe it. I've never even heard of anything on any news mentioning our village, ever, <laughs> until I saw this and I thought, oh gosh, this is not, not um, the place you want to um, um, you hear about it, you know, much rather to hear something good instead of something as awful as that. I read recently about the new president of South Africa. Yes. He wears a native garb and carries a machine gun. <laughs> and I'm, I, have you? No, do you I have haven't. Have any opinion about that? No, him? I don't even know. My who... nephew in law is from South Africa near Rhodes. Oh, right. And he was telling me how bad things are there now. Oh, I, well, I went back there two years ago and it was. Um, no, in 19, uh, 2006, when my brother-in-law died, and my sister is, um, she's a half-sister. She was my father's first wife's daughter, <laughs> which is all in the book. <laughs> um, but she, um, she's, she was thinking about going to England, and I, I said to her, you know, her husband had died, and I said, why? I said, you've never even lived in England. You're 80. Why go to England? You know, what's your life going to be? All your friends are here in Africa. You need to stay here, you know. And um, she has, she changed. She lived in a place called Jeffreys Bay, which is on the coast, on the Cape, and there's a little, um, a road that runs through the sea, and then there's an island, and the house was on the island. But all the other houses were um, houses for, holiday houses so people weren't there most of the time she was there all the time and so she was petrified because just here was an African village and she had to go through the African village to go into the main town and she didn't she was afraid you know she was old elderly should I say elderly and she was afraid so she actually sold up and moved into the town and got an apartment where she was didn't have to go through the African reserve which you don't know I mean South Africa is very dangerous, very dangerous. And it's such a shame because it's a beautiful, beautiful country. And I, I just love Africa and um, I'm just so, so sad that, you know, it, it's so dangerous now for everybody. You know, I mean, blacks as well, look at all the killings and which were ter uh, tribal, totally tribal, nothing to do with blacks and whites recently in Kenya, you know, last year. Um, they were killing each other off, you know. It's just sad. Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs> Oh, wow. Oh, thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much. This is really kind. It's, it's um, $16. $16 for the book. Yes, and I'll sign if you want any books. $16. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, this is wonderful. Thank you so much.